Welcome back. As we stand on the brink of a new economic era, India's march towards becoming a six trillion economy is not just a testament to its resilience and dynamism, but also a beacon of opportunity for investors around the globe. Without further ado, let's start with the next panel discussion where the panelists are. Mr. Sunil Singhania. Mr. Sunil is the founder of Abacus Asset Management. Prior to this, in his role as Global Head of Equities at Reliance Capital Limited, he oversaw equity assets and provided strategic inputs across Reliance Capital group of companies, including asset management, insurance, AIF and offshore assets. And as CIO Equities, he led Reliance Mutual Fund equity schemes to be rated amongst the best. Reliance Growth Fund grew over 100 times in less than 22 years under his leadership. Our next panelist is Mr. Nilesh Shah. Mr. Nilesh is Managing Director of Kotak AMC. Nilesh led his team to the Best Fund House of the Year Award at all the mutual funds where he has worked with Kotak, ICICI Prudential and Franklin Templeton Mutual Fund. He is a part-time member of the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister. He is a member of the Board of Association of Mutual Funds in India and a member of COBOSAC Committee of SEBI. He is also President of India's oldest Chamber of Commerce with Bombay Chamber of Commerce and Industry in the city of Mumbai. Mr. Rajesh Kothari. Mr. Rajesh is the founder and managing director of Alpha Accurate Advisors. He is the visionary behind the customer drivel and excellence based approach. A CWA and an MBA by qualification, he has a rich experience of more than 20 years in the Indian capital markets and has handled several investment projects in premier investment institutions. During his tenure as a fund manager at DSP Merrill Lynch Fund Managers, now DSP BlackRock Investment Managers, the equity assets under his management flourished from $100 million to $1.5 billion. All through this period of five years, the equity schemes often ranked in its first quartile ranking by Crystal. Mr. Vikas Khemani. Mr. Vikas is the CEO and CIO at Carnelian Asset Advisors. He is a chartered accountant and CFA charter holder, USA. He has 22 years of capital markets experience, most recently as the CEO of erstwhile Edelweiss Securities Limited, where he spent 17 years incubating and building several businesses to leadership, including institutional equities business and equity research. Vikas served as a member of the CII National Council on Corporate Governance and Piggy Capital Markets Committee. He has been awarded with Young Professional Achievers Award for the Service Sector by the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India in 2014. This session will be moderated by Mr. Kamal Manocha. Mr. Kamal is the founder and CEO at PMS AIF World. He is responsible for driving the overall business across both wealth management as well as content management. Over past five years, PMS AI World has conceptualized various innovations under his capable thought leadership. The most recent one being the quality, risk and consistency framework created to deep dive the space of portfolio management services. Kamal brings with him 18 years of experience, holds a master's degree in management and a bachelor's degree in economics from Hansraj College, Delhi University, and many more investment certifications. Over to you, Mr. Manocha. Thanks, Akriti. It is indeed my pleasure to moderate such an esteemed panel. Without taking much time, I will just, you know, give a, a opening remark that today at this juncture we are all bullish quite optimistic about india and uh, that is how we have kept the topic of this event as you know six years to six trillion indian economy so my first question to you nilesh bhai is that we want to moderate this panel in a very realistic manner 
want to add as real value to as our clients as possible. So is this really a breakout moment for India or we are, you know, too optimistic? There's a chance that we are too optimistic because stock markets are roaring because, you know, stock markets set our sentiments. So thank you, Kamal, for inviting me over here. Well, in life, one should never say never. We have seen in recently con concluded World Cup, we won 10 matches in a row. And in the final, we couldn't convert the magic to reality. But subject to that, never say never. I think this time there is breakout moment for India. And there are three reasons why this breakout is coming. One, the Indian talent, which was going abroad for opportunities, is now staying back. Many people are becoming entrepreneur in India, seeking opportunities in India. And Shantnu Narayan of Adobe summed it up. If I was growing up in today's Hyderabad, no way I would leave for America. Talent also requires capital. That capital is being made available by private equity venture capital ecosystem. 90,000 plus startups are funded $140 billion in last decade. Talent and capital together also needs infrastructure. India is building infrastructure rapidly. What was existing in 2013, almost similar infrastructure is being built between 2014 and 24. This combination of talent, capital and infrastructure gives confidence that this is a breakout time for India. It has moved from 10th largest economy in 2014 to 5th largest economy in 2022. And hopefully we will become 3rd largest economy before the end of this decade. Sure, Nilesh Bhai, very well said. So moving on to, you know, uh, Sunil ji, you know, uh, Nilesh Bhai mentioned that uh, we are, we have moved from 2014 to now to fifth largest economy. All of us know that. And probably as India will move to six trillion economy, we could be a third largest economy. But today, if we see, you know, top hundred companies, India from India, I guess there are three companies, which is Reliance, uh, I think at 44th position, TCS at 68th position, and then HGFC Bank at 95th position. So these are obviously all giant large companies in India. As Indian economy will grow from three, three and a half, three point seven to six trillion, there will be, uh, which means that there will there is a scope of many more large cap companies, you know, to be part of top hundred companies, which does, which does convey that within large cap also there will be some companies which could turn I would say four bagger five bagger over next say six years as India migrates from three trillion to six trillion do you agree with this viewpoint and what kind of companies you know would those be I think thank you again uh, Kamal for having me too uh, so I echo Nilesh Bhai's uh, positive sentiments I only say that whoever has been positive in India over the last 20, 25 years, despite all the ups and downs, have had good health, good wealth, and a lot of smiles. So it makes sense to be positive in India. And I think uh, our view is that over the next 10, 15 years also, whoever stays positive will uh, have good health, wealth, and smiles. Coming to our specific question, I think as the economy grows, uh, the composition of our spending, the composition of the economy also changes. So if you look at the first $1 trillion of the economy, which took us 60 years to achieve, 1947 to 2007, that $1 trillion spending was on very different, uh, you know, items. So we were like uh, craving for food, basic clothing, basic needs, uh, and so on and so on. The next trillion and the next trillion and the next trillion, we started to demand more and more wants. I'm giving you a long answer, but you know, just to give you a little bit of perspective, out of the 1.4 billion people we have in India, only one third can afford any kind of bonds at this point of time. Two thirds are just struggling to meet their needs. This over the next 10 years will change dramatically. So, out of the 1.5 trillion people, billion people, you'll have one billion who can afford some bonds, and therefore the multiplier effect of the economy going going from 
3.5 to 7 or 8 or 10 will be very very different coming to a specific question you know there will always be companies whether in the large cap mid cap or small cap which will give you uh, much higher returns than the normal market and the economy there is this one company nvidia which grew in one day by 300 billion dollars so it added in one day uh, a market cap equivalent to the largest indian company uh, and I think that clearly shows the potential of any company, whether large, small or mid, which has uh, kept pace with the changing technology and which has obviously done well. However, I will always say this, that you know there will obviously be a lot of companies which will inch towards the $100 billion market cap in India. There are hardly a handful of three, four, five companies which are right now $100 billion in market cap. As we grow, there will be many more. Uh, but my uh, request to uh, uh, investors would be that, you know, just look at compounding your overall wealth rather than just trying to chase companies which can be 5, 6, 7x. The other thing is, you know, 5x in 6 years is not going to be very easy for a large company. 5x in 6 years is like crazy uh, kagger over, over this. Yes, there might be some one or two extraordinarily technologically savvy companies which can uh, which can go there but i think if you just take a six year view uh, uh, you know you can maybe you know have a doubler or a tripler in large companies i don't think uh, there will be too many companies which can become five or six x but uh, overall even if you grow at 15 percent you will double your money in five years maybe slightly more in six years and i think those kind of uh, possibilities uh, the probability is much more Sure, sure, Sunil. So moving on to you, Rajesh, you know, we, we in this particular panel are wanting to understand how Nifty 500's construction will kind of, you know, transform over this period, over six years when India's, India will progress to six trillion. And today we know the top sector is like financial services with 29% weight. And then uh, it is technology with around 11% weight. And then we have seen oil and gas coming up with around nine and a half, ten percent weight. These three sectors comprise of almost 50% and remaining 50% is spread across, I would say, power, infrastructure, real estate, media, you know, and likewise, chemicals, textiles. So if you have to, you know, go say in future and kind of imagine that we are a five and a half, six trillion economy and market cap is also 100% of GDP. At that juncture, what do you see will be top three sectors? Will we see you know, any sectors on the bottom coming up in top three or, you know, what are your views in this regards? So thanks, Kamal, first of all, for having me uh, in, on this panel. And uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, very difficult to actually predict, you know, what will become top because then you are predicting two things, what will go down and then what will go up, right? So it's a two-way call what we are making. But let me give you some color on the U.S. market. So if you look at U.S. Uh, in last 12 years, uh, if I'm not wrong, the weightage of technology has moved up, almost doubled, from 14% to 29%. And all other sectors, be it power, be it energy, be it finance, be it consumer, most of these sectors basically, they lost in terms of the percentage of S&P 500 and everything is basically made by the uh, you know, technology. So I think going forward, if you ask my personal view, uh, there is a lot of going to be, what I would say, not technology, technology, but automation, uh, innovation, whether it's led by technology or not, maybe the green part of the energy and so on and so forth. That will also enter into, you know, the indices, correct? Say, for example, this huge p &I effect. Now, let's assume, for example, if India makes, say, 10, 20 billion dollars of investment into, say, chips or semiconductor or something like that, and that's what, uh, you know, our uh, Honorable Prime Minister is, you know, looking for, then the ambit of next 10 years, there can be a lot of new addition to this index. Probably the companies are not listed currently, but those companies will also get listed and they will list with a huge uh, value, uh, market cap, as well as probably even profits. Because remember one thing, in US, this 29% technology is more driven by valuation. The profit growth is lesser and the valuation is significantly expanded, particularly for tech savvy kind of a competition, right? So I think that there is going to be, uh, you know, definitely, you know, only constant is change and this will also change. Whether banking and finance will remain at current level or not, I don't know. But within banking and financing, the technology-led banking, 
the innovation led banking or innovation led energy or innovation led you know decarbonization or innovation led you know the semiconductor side and so on and so forth that probably can become a new pillar not only for india but probably even in the you know global indices and that may result into some changes here and right raj is quite interesting moving on to you vikas you know your shift strategy actually has become very popular over the last 3 years i remember we awarding you in 2020 21 when the strategy was launched post covid and there has been a real shift that we have also seen where you now everybody is not today talking about manufacturing and as you were talking about you know differentiating weights i remember you know if one year ago i would have asked this question from any anyone what is the top sector that you want to select everybody would have said financial services but financial services has actually not performed that much in last one year and maybe that probably has you know given advantage to your shift strategy because whatever we have seen little fall in weights of financial services sector in nifty 500 has gone to manufacturing so is this you know i would say overdone or is this beginning of a new i would say you know change which is happening in the overall construction of nifty 500 and uh, kamal thanks a lot first of all for having me on this distinguished panel uh first of all i think you know i truly believe that and echo a previous sentiment of sunil and nilesh that india is in a transformative phase uh where a lot of things are happening which is unprecedented and 10 years of reforms and if you see there is very big change which has happened in the mindset there are broadly three change which are driving i mean first time in india we are working from instead of incremental mindset to an exponential mindset everything is being executed at the rapid pace secondly we are working with a known constraint environment in the sense that you know we don't any more say that we don't have money our constraints are not money earlier it used to be narrative used to be that we don't have money right so huge amount of change of mindset has happened thirdly india is finding its own solution its to its problem earlier we were looking for Uh, towards the west for our solution so there is a very big shift has happened in terms of how you are looking at evolving indian economy over the next 5 10 15 years and thankfully prime minister has given a call of viksit bharat by you know the amrit kal gets over so i think india is in a very very big transformative phase and that's how we have to look at entire opportunity space according to me as our economy goes from 4 trillion dollar to 30 trillion dollar over the next 25 years and in the middle of that lot of transformation will happen of course manufacturing is the one which you, as you rightly said that we picked up pretty early in 2020 and you know we've been benefiting from that but it is actually a very long transition fact of the matter is that today also our manufacturing gdp is half a trillion dollar and if our gdp in uh, you know 47 to become 30 trillion dollar our manufacturing gdp will become 16x to 8 trillion dollar from there now of course in this journey of five, half a trillion dollar to 8 trillion dollar which is twice of our current total gdp many opportunities will get created wealth creation will happen the size size shape size of the opportunity will keep changing evolving as the economy evolves right but the fact of the matter is that india kind of economy you know cannot remain only you know services it has to balance out on the manufacturing so so to answer your question i think it is here to stay it is a massive opportunity size of the companies is again will change and again i'll share with interesting data with you in 2000 you know we had only 20 companies with more than 1 billion dollar market cap today we have 500 companies in 2000 we had only two companies with more than 10 billion dollar market cap today we have 86 companies so how companies size and scale change with time we have seen this in our lives in last 20 years and i see no reason why this this potential cannot be even bigger as we are going through this transformative phase whether it is manufacturing or you know whether it is consumption or financials i mean every sector will have intermittent cycles you know you will have a sector like financial as it consolidating now so all those cycles will be there over next 10 15 20 years but back to the matter is all of these sectors will grow over a long period of time to a massive size than what they are today sure sure vikas moving on to uh, nilesh with the thought you know which where vikas has left uh, you know that every sector has a cycle every sector you know sees a phase of consolidation and euphoria and currently technology as a sector is also seeing consolidation we have seen that over last 18 months and this question to you nilesh bhai because you know i know kotak is running a technology fund i am sure the timing of that is uh, you know thoughtful but uh, what i feel and what you know my clients also kind of and they discuss with me 
you know is that within technology sector we have traditional companies all tcs infosys and services companies which are going to face a lot of competition from new age chat gpt generative ai type companies and such companies are not there in indian listed markets so now obviously price wise we know technology sector is attractive but how do you see that growth wise given the future competitions coming and is that really you now an attractive opportunity hence given this confusion the best time to raise money is probably when it is the worst time to invest and the worst time to raise money is probably when it is the best time to invest on technology all the worries which you mention is probably known to the market and reflected into the valuation now will this companies reinvent itself to use ai to create cheaper faster better solutions for their customers our companies did transit from infrastructure management code writing application maintenance to cyber security to cloud computing to consulting same way they will transit using ai to provide better solutions today there are two developments which have happened in it sector worldwide one a french company etos is probably going into bankruptcy and likely to be bailed out by french government it employs more than 100000 people clients probably will shift their business from etos to other it companies as their financial health remains vulnerable that's a large business which can come towards indian it company there is another company trema knows which provides core banking solution that's going into bankruptcy also today the leader in core banking solutions are two indian companies will some business come answer is yes with such kind of companies bankruptcy from etos to trema knows will more people allocate business to indian it companies whose balance sheet has billions of dollars of cash quite likely so we believe there will be opportunity in technology sector i don't see technology sector giving return in next 3 to 6 months but that is the best time to accumulate stocks and build your portfolio i have no doubt in my mind that indian it companies will reinvent themselves and they will use ai to deliver cheaper better faster solutions to their customers don't forget that within ai 40% plus codes are still written by indians either in india or outside of india sure nirej bhai we really value your wise thoughts uh, moving on to you rajesh uh, you know we also know that over next say decade when we will see uh, this progress happening in many corporates there will be next generation that will be coming up because we know you know many well known brands and many well known large companies from uh, profit size as you were mentioning right they will see their next you know uh, generation kind of coming up in the largest of the company or maybe in some of the mid cap companies also so obviously how how will that because this new next generation is like people who 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 are born with golden spoon earlier set of entrepreneurs in india india being an entrepreneurial economy were people who have actually created things but these are those i would say generation of people who will kind of inherit all these things all 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 the businesses how will that change you know the the future of corporate india we talk about attractive demographics young age in india as attractive thing but from business point of view how will that change the the future of corporate india well i think uh, there are you know multiple uh, what i would say dimensions to your uh, you know topic because um, there are clearly there will be two 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 sections of the corporate so one where there is a succession planning in place am i right and where succession planning is place it means the next generation would like to continue that business in that business if the cash flow is very strong then the new divisions are getting created because let's assume one chairman has two man managing director one promoter for example has two sons for example then typically they incubate the two divisions within the company right and over a period of time each division become larger 
Say, for example, today, you know, Reliance Industries, for example, you know, how many divisions Reliance has created over the last 20, 30 years is huge. All right? If you look at the earlier Reliance and then multiple uh, sections within that, and even in the new avatar of Reliance, multiple businesses within Reliance. And at some point of time, each business will unlock value for the shareholders because every uh, MD of that particular division, CE of that division, will basically get listed and the new business will get created. So that's the one way to look at it. Second way to look at it is that the businesses where there is no succession planning or maybe the next generation would not like to continue the same business. They might be doing their something on their own. Uh, they might be outside India and so on and so forth. Now here, as you are already saying, there are a lot of businesses which are getting sold maybe to private equity guys or maybe the existing other companies, maybe the competitors, they are buying them out. Yeah. Or alternatively, the professional management is uh, coming inside that and they are now basically looking after the entire thing. So clearly there are three sections uh, within the corporate India. Uh, one, where we see uh, you know, future potential value unlocking in a much bigger way because they have a clear uh, succession planning in place. Second, where uh, the businesses are getting uh, sold out, maybe to private equity investors or maybe to the, uh, you know, the existing players. And third, where the professional managements are coming into it, and they are basically, you know, now expanding and growing that business. So, depending upon again, case to case, it depends, you know, how you look at the overall impact. But that's why I'm just linking it to what I said previously. That's the reason I'm saying that even Nifty 500, or forget Nifty 500, overall market, you might see many new businesses getting listed. And many of this will be the offshoot of the existing companies. But as business become more viable, they will raise capital. Capital is easily available, as Nilis by say. So it is easy to get two, three, four, five, ten billion dollars if you have a good blueprint. If it is executed, is a proven business, and then you get it listed separately. And then that will also become part of the indices kind of thing because the business are really size. It's a sizable business I'm talking about. So I think that's a trend. What I'm seeing the two things you need to think together, combine, and then you need to envisage what can happen over the next five, ten years. Hey, Rajesh. Moving on to you, uh, Sunil, you know, we have uh, over last say 20 years of history of equity markets have understood that when Nifty 50 or Nifty 500 P reaches close to 25, 26, 27, it is considered as an expensive territory. But we have seen, you know, two and a half years ago during COVID because of maybe excessive liquidity at that point of time, PEs had gone beyond 35, 37 also. And then earnings were low, but liquidity was high. But today we know at this juncture when Nifty 500 PE would be around 25 on trailing basis, liquidity is still high and may be expected to rise because interest rates are peaking and liquidity is high because DI flows are high. And at the same time, earnings are also high and rising. So both these factors are like positive. So at this juncture at 25 PE, are we, should we follow the old, I would say learning that this is an expensive zone or that needs to be revised in our overall thought process i think uh, uh, very clearly you know as a value conscious investor and that is the theme i have followed last 25 30 years uh, i would uh, definitely give credence to valuation but having said that i think equity markets are all about uh, the future they are not about uh, the past or the immediate present you mentioned about COVID, I think that time, as you rightly said, businesses had gone through massive disruption. And therefore, the, the, the profit numbers or the valuations were not a true indicator. And therefore, to say, you know, if someone was doing 100 in sales and suddenly it became 50 and you then say that, no, this company is now valued at 80, uh, B, that was not the right indication because uh, the businesses had got disrupted because of a very unusual once in a century kind of a event. Now, as we speak today, I'll talk about Nifty. I think Nifty last year learning growth has been phenomenal, obviously on a low base because of the reason you mentioned. But as we speak, at least for the next two years, there's a clear visibility of earnings growth of 15 to 18. And if you take some of the large booking outfit uh, projections and including our own in-house, we are expecting uh, Nifty EPS be anywhere between 1135 to 1150 for FY25 and exceeding 1300 as we speak for FY26. And even at an all-time high level of 22,000, I think that makes us trade at 17 times one year forward because by March, April, we'll start to trade FY26 as one year forward. 
the ten year average is around sixteen, sixteen point one. So we are yes five six percent higher than the long term average, but nowhere close to that twenty five thirty p which you mentioned. As far as the broader markets are concerned, I completely agree with you that there are pockets where earnings have or valuations have no meaning because if the company is not making profit, whether the whether the p whether the price is x or hundred uh, x, it's the same. So there are a lot of companies where there is no profit. There's a lot of hope. There is a lot of noise. There's a lot of FOMO. There's a lot of momentum. I would also say there is a lot of manipulation. Uh, and that is causing a broader index like 500 which you mentioned because that includes 500 companies and a lot of them might be companies where there is uh, these kind of uh, situations where prices have gone up meaning so i think as investors we are still able to find companies with decent valuation obviously not as cheap as it was 2 years back and i as a buyer we would like uh, valuations to be what they were 2 years back as sellers we would like valuations to be where, where you are saying at 25 30 p but life is not like that so i think while admitting that there is a big category of uh, of markets where one has to be very careful i think overall markets are far far away uh, from the euphoric 25 30 p which we are uh, talking about the other thing you know we are all talking about uh, what markets would be after 6 years and therefore you know taking your own cue i would also request you to take the p multiple of how they would look like after 3 4 5 years 6 years rather than taking what they are looking on a trailing uh, 12 month basis and i think if if the investor is comfortable making reasonable returns and i would say reasonable returns would be somewhere in the mid teens uh, there is a lot of lot of room to be not disappointed but if you are looking at making 50% returns which maybe some of our funds or vikas's funds or some of the other funds have made you would be very disappointed because if we start to make 50% kagar then you know indians would have 90% of the, all the billionaires in the world sure 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 sunil you are probably hinting that a near term market looks expensive but yes for long term investors yes there is a massive you know i'm not saying that what i'm saying is the return expectations have to be realistic you know that is the only thing i am saying see markets being expensive not expensive both the beauty is in the eye of the beholder uh, but one has to be careful and one has to follow the philosophy what one believes in sure 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 so i'll just uh, you know take next uh, question from nilesh bhai because nilesh bhai has to leave uh, this is the last question to you nilesh bhai then you can leave is this that you know we have uh, been talking about various sectors and then one sector which is like always talked uh, in last 10 12 15 years was a consum- consumption sector both staples as well as discretionary which today if we you know hear the results is like looking weak and guidance is also weak so on the on one side we are talking about a lot of manufacturing a lot of industrial activity and on the other side the consumption side of india is weak there is a divergence which is being created so is it not signifying is does this signify a risk or does this signify a reversion to mean whereby we'll see you know now consumption sector coming up and maybe the industrials and the manufacturing and the, that side kind of taking a back seat given that everything works on cycles as you also mentioned so kamal it is a risk as well as an opportunity the risk is that mass market products are growing at a lower rate than premium products rural consumption is growing at a lower rate than urban consumption and top half the top half of the pyramid is consuming at a faster pace than bottom half of the pyramid probably unorganized sector is also taking market share from organized sector put all these things together the lofty valuation which consumer staple and consumer durable companies were having has not materialized the volume growth in mass market rural and bottom half of the pyramid is way below market's expectation to justify those valuations now going forward will consumption recover we believe it's a question of if a question of when not if and as consumption recovers with lower valuation 
it's likely that consumer staple also will start doing well. If you can build a portfolio which is focused on premium products today, which is focused on urban consumption, and which is focused on top half of the pyramid, that should have done well even in today's tough time. Going forward as recovery happens, I think consumer staples will also have its day in the sun. Sure, Nilesh Bhai. Thank you so much, you know, for uh, joining. Thank you. Me. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Because moving on to you, you know, within manufacturing sector or manufacturing as a segment, there are so many, I would say, sectors. So if you were to talk about within manufacturing, because manufacturing itself is a, a overall theme, I want you to kind of highlight, you know, few subsectors within manufacturing, which you see are very attractive. Like we have seen over the last five years, a lot of wealth was created by specialty chemicals, which is like subsector of manufacturing. And likewise, there could be many more. It could be textiles or it could be, you know, any other sector which could come from bottom because your research in manufacturing, I think, you know, is going to be the best because you have a fund which is focused in that area. Hence this question to you. Yes, Kamal. So I think as you rightly said that manufacturing is a very wide sector. So there are two kinds of manufacturing. One is the commoditized manufacturing, whether it is steel, cement and all that. And secondly is more specialized. Uh, especially, I think the opportunity set, which I think is going to be very, very attractive and investing, uh, interesting would be what sits between import substitution and export oriented. As you know, because of the Atman Hidul Bharat program, India is looking to re replace its all imports. Uh, and because of China plus one, Europe plus one, and India's posh competitiveness, a lot of export potential is arising. So combination of these two will create a massive opportunity, especially in the manufacturing uh, of the specialties. So, and this will be in a very wide sectors. Uh, for example, uh, specialty chemical is one. I mean, while the sector has not done well so well in the last one year, but we think it continues to remain one of the more promising opportunities over the next 10-15 years. India is still has a very small share and it will keep on growing. Of course, it will have its own cycle, but that's kind of very promising. Same thing would be there in consumer-consumer electronics. Uh, we are beginning to see many players getting scale size there uh, and in times to come, it will only get bigger. Uh, it's probably from a size of the opportunity perspective, again, to be another... 2030x from here, you know, as an overall sector in next 10 years. Uh, you know, uh, garmenting is a very big opportunity. Footwear manufacturing is a very big opportunity. Uh, you know, capital goods, by the way, India is exporting reasonably large, uh, you know, uh, 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 um, materials across various uh, you know, products. So, and many more segments are emerging as economy emerges because, you know, a lot of newer and newer segments, and we get amazed by what sectors you would never think suddenly export opportunities are emerging so over next 10 year, 15 years you will see a smaller companies getting size and scale secondly newer newer segment getting you know uh, opportunity and we have to constantly keep on looking at defense by the way is a very big opportunity which kind of you can put it in a in a allied manufacturing um, a space so it's it's a massive opportunity across these sub segments and newer and newer segments will appear and today probably we have low end manufacturing and in times to come you will see specialized high end manufacturing also emerging but probably that might be slightly away but as i said that over time it will keep on changing its size shape and color and uh, the advancement sure vikas moving on to you rajesh you had mentioned in the last answer that probably those companies across sectors which will follow innovation, which will follow maybe, you know, uh, tech to scale their businesses will probably come in top positions. Now, obviously, in, in current context, if I was to talk about few such companies, like, for example, let's take names like PB Fintech, Paytm, Zomato, Nika, you know, all these companies, few com very, very few examples of companies which maybe actually will remain because we have seen in the past if one was to study a history of say last more than 50 years many big companies including names like intel they are no more existing many companies actually you know failed also when we're talking about projecting future there could be many companies which may not exist at all so how would you actually you know make a right choice and how will you protect investors given this possibility also a very good question, and that's where the role of active management comes into play, am I right? So as a as a manager, you know, what we need to do is that, uh, and what we follow at least is the being cogile. So be quality conscious in what we are buying into, but 
Then we need to monitor the business cycle of each company. The business needs to be resilient. They need to be agile. They need to be relevant. If not, those businesses will get disrupted and someone else will take up their share, correct? And therefore, you need to monitor the business cycle and just buying right is not enough. And then you need to get out of it, all right? So say, for example, you know, you, you gave it a few names which are at the forefront of technology disruption and which everybody knows, uh, you know, probably those are household names. But there are many more names, even within capital goods, for example, you know, uh, and they are forefront of the uh, entire engineering side of the technology. And globally, they are forefront, right? And they are all are listed players in India. So the exit strategy is as critical, uh, you know, as the entry strategy. Um, life uh, business cycles are getting shorter and shorter. On an average, earlier, 20 years back, they used to say the business cycle is, you know, more than 95 years. That cycle is now reduced to less than 32 years. It means so many businesses will get wiped out at the end of decade, am I right? And which you and I might be liking today, but after 10 years, we, you know, all of us will forget. Look at Nifty itself. So many companies exited Nifty in last 20 years. The largest player of textile, the largest, one of the largest player in telecom, one of the largest player in power, one of the largest company in capital goods, uh, and many more such companies. They all exited Nifty. Many of these companies are down 95% from their peak valuation. They all were part of Sensex, so you can imagine uh, kind of a wealth erosion, what has happened, 95% wealth erosion I'm talking about. So exit is extremely critical, you know, and in this particular kind of a market, you know, which we are referring to kind of a little bit euphoric market in few pockets. I think, uh, you know, uh, earlier there was like, you know, FOMO, you know, fear of missing out. Then there's a ROMO, you know, regret of missing out. And I think soon we will get JOMO, joy of missing out. You know, you know? Uh, so I think it's extremely important to be uh, vigilant. Uh, to make sure that you buy the company which are resilient business models, am I right? And then monitor their business cycle, make sure that they have a growth, uh, you know, over the next two, three, four, five years, a foreseeable period. And whenever you see that things are changing, the cycles are changing, and the company is not responsive enough, uh, you know, you need to get out. Look at the retail business, for example. You know, all are good companies within retail, which are all are listed players, correct? But look at the one retail company growth versus the other two retail companies growth. You know, there are two companies which are degrowing, and one company is growing at 20% compounded year after year from last two and a half, three years, or actually 30% compounded. Now, all our market leaders, they all have smart management, everything is smart, but then, hey, what's going wrong? Am I right? So, uh, I think for every gainer, there are going to be two or three or five losers, and uh, our job is to keep bidding out those players, uh, keep exiting the players where we believe the execution can be the risk, or technology can be the risk, or the disruption can be the risk, or compliance can be the risk. I think the biggest risk. Uh, globally, what is emerging is compliance. Like earlier, it used to be only in pharma sector, uh, you know, US FDA kind of a risk. Now, even in fintech sector, because you know the regulator is going to be very, very strict because ultimately you are dealing with, you know, uh, someone's money and so on and so forth. So, those kind of risks you need to keep in mind when investing into the business. Sure, Rajesh, moving on to you, Sunil. So, we you mentioned, you know, valuation is something which you always have focus upon. And you also, uh, you know, mentioned that you would love to be seller at high valuations. And which also conveys that, especially in the mid and small cap, I would say segment, which is again, your uh, forte, there, there should be profit booking, you know, which should be done at some point of time, because, you know, when valuations are up, and they can go down. We have seen that many times in the past that leads to a very bad experience. So many investors, or many clients of ours who have given money to you across closed ended funds, as well as PMSs, they want to ask this question that, you know, do you plan to maybe add cash levels or how would you ensure that this time, if we see such correction happening, maybe the experience is relatively balanced. I think uh, so. You know, there is never a very straight answer to this, but I'll just give you a little bit of perspective, at least from what we believe. So one is, uh, what is the reason for the profit? Is it because the fund has gone up or the returns have been fabulous? Uh, and that's why you are booking profit. I think that is the wrong way of doing it. Because if you would have done that, for example, NVIDIA, if anyone would have just profit just because the price has gone up, they would have never made 1,000, 10,000 times return which uh, the, the stock is given. So I think just because uh, you are significantly in the money, should you book profit? The answer is very, very clear. 
Second is what are you looking at? Whether are you looking at a 30% fall in the market, 40% fall in the market, or a 5-10% correction in the market? I think 5-10% correction in the market can happen 2-3 times a year. And at least at this point of time, given the fact that Nifty is at 17 times, uh, you know, we don't see a correction which is going to be very significant. Now, to, to be a god to sell at the highest level and to buy it back at 10% lower, I think it's going to be impossible. The second thing is the moment you sell, you will end up paying 11-12% long-term capital gain tax. So even if the market corrects by 10%, you will be worse off. Uh, even if you are able to sell at the highest level and buy at the lowest level. The next thing is as portfolio managers, I'm very sure all of us keep on evaluating the portfolios on a day-to-day -day basis. And we do take calls of booking profits where we believe that the stock is significantly higher than fair value. If the stock is 5-7% higher than fair value, you know, to sell and then buy it back, I think it's an impossible task. And therefore, if you actually see the average P multiple of our fund, even now, it is like 14 times F520. Now, you know, you mentioned about 25 times uh, or 20 times. I think it is our job as portfolio managers to stick to our own philosophy. And that is what we have tried to, you know, maintain the ROC, ROE of the portfolio at upwards of 18%, profit growth of upwards of 20%. And that is the reason why the PE multiple, even at these kind of uh, levels, is coming to 14 times. Because the profit growth is ensuring that even if you make 15, 18% return, the profit growth is significantly better uh, than the return. So I would say that unless you need money, see, you save because you might need it at, uh, on a rainy day. So unless you need the money for some other thing, which is buying a house or something else, uh, please stay put. Sure, Sunil. Thank you for your reply. Vikas, moving on to you, you know, we have seen interim budget from government and in this budget, government has mentioned that they want to keep their, you know, governance, discipline, tight and I don't see too much allocation done to PLI and PLI was one scheme which has actually uh, led to uh, I would say a lot of benefit to manufacturing and we have also seen in last three years China plus one story which also helped to man give, give, give a lot of orders to manufacturing but there also competition is emerging and rising so how how much you what do you think you know is the attractiveness of India as an economy towards manufacturing, given these two factors, which were the ones which would have led you to think of shifting, you know, uh, towards manufacturing, India shifting towards manufacturing when you had launched that shift strategy. Frankly, TLI is only one of the reasons and that continues to remain very strong supporter of the government has given uh, you know, uh, NFL more support for many sectors. So I don't see any reason why that won't be there. But PLI is just one reason. Secondly, if you see India's cost competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis China has anyway improved. Our labor cost is $200, China's labor cost is $800. Our power cost is kind of same in China. Ours is coming down. You know, logistics costs are getting better. Uh, so, and more importantly, I think, you know, uh, there is a sheer, you know, supply chain diversification which is happening. So it, when people were outsourcing from China, uh, that moving away from China is no more only about cost. It is also about resilience, about supply chain diversification. So I don't see this trend is changing. I mean, there could be quarter, two quarter slowdown here and there. That can happen. But as I was saying earlier, this is a very long term, you know, 10, 15 year theme where our GDP will become from 0.5 trillion dollar to, you know, 8 trillion dollar over the next 20, 25 years. So when that journey is there, you will have intermittent all kind of things. But Overall, India's cost competitive, I mean, PLI is only one of the reasons why it is doing well, but there are other uh, reasons. Import substitution is, again, very big reason for that. You know, there is robust demand in India. So, I don't see, you know, uh, two kind of this changing anytime, uh, you know, there will be slowdown, but there won't be any reversal in that sense, is what I would say. So, we just move on to last two questions uh, from Rajesh and Sunil both. You can uh, choose to answer uh, as you wish. We have seen, you know, last two years, this old economy bull run, which has come up where BSUs, infrastructure, real estate, these sectors, which are like not doing well at all, they have performed a lot. And we also call it a, like a, you know, valuation focused bull run. So do you see this kind of a changing for long or it was just a cycle 
which just happened for two three years, and then again we'll be back to growth cycle. I'll take this, and maybe Rajesh can add. What is the definition of holding? Is having good roads, good airports, good telecom, uh, best Wi-Fi? Is is that holding? So I don't understand this cliched word of growth stocks. You know, all the growth, so-called growth stocks in India grow at ten percent. And that is the reason why they are struggling last three four years. You should just see the growth rate. You know, uh, uh, unlike the perception that they are growing at twenty twenty five percent, the actual growth rates are ten eleven percent. And that's why all these so called consumption stocks are are uh, growing at ten eleven percent. And we call them new economy. You know, uh, soaps and detergents is new economy. Building world class airports is old economy. So I I don't understand that. Second is you know if you aspire and the topic is to go to six trillion and beyond if you aspire to be three and a half trillion to twenty thirty trillion only by uh, selling soaps and shampoos will you be thirty trillion dollar you know you will have to build infrastructure there will be companies who will have to build roads airports there will have to be companies who build manufacturing there will have to be companies who build steel cement metals so you know यहाँ पे जो capex करता है that is old economy and bad companies and the People who are just selling soaps and shampoos and transferring 70 by 80 percent of the profit out of the country, they are considered to be great companies. I don't understand. This. And we have seen how over the last three, four, five days, all these so-called uh, uh, delisting candidates are coming in selling their stuff. So I think we have to get over this cliched word of old economy, new economy. I think every company, every sector has a place in the economy, and we should accept that. Maybe there are some investors who say I will not invest in that sector. That from our perspective, we invest in all sectors in all companies as long as they have discipline as far as capital allocation is concerned. They have decent ROC, ROE, and they have decent, uh, you know, I would say credence to the fact that they respect minority share. Sure. Yeah, sure. No, I think uh, uh, Sunil has rightly, uh, you know, summed it up, but. One important thing also I want to further add that please do not differentiate between private versus PSU. There is nothing called PSUs can do well or PSU can't do well or private could. There are enough companies on both the sides which have done exemplary super job in execution over the last 10, 20, 30 years. And at the same time, there are equally bad examples on both the sides, PSU as well as private, right? As a manager, what is our job? You know, what we do is that we identify business irrespective of be it PSU or be it private. And if there is a growth in it, which is higher than the country's GDP growth, so if our nominal GDP growth is around, say, 12%, and if we see opportunity in that company, that that company can deliver earnings growth of 12, 14, 15, 17, 18% over the next two, three years, then surely market will pay attention to it. Now, there are many companies, what you talked about, uh, you know, within utilities, uh, within oil and gas, uh, and since many of them are particularly into the PSU as a basket, they didn't deliver that very high growth. If you look at last seven, eight, nine, ten years, correct? And therefore, their valuation got compressed. Compared to that with many other sectors where the growth was high on a relative basis, and therefore their valuations have moved up. But then from last one and a half, two years, what has changed is that because of the renewable energy on the power side, because of the new capex and therefore capital goods side. This company, which were basically suppressed earnings growth for last 10 years, all of a sudden they have a prospect to grow at a higher rate, significantly higher rate compared to their last historic 10 years. On top of it, the valuations were also compressed. Correct? So on a relative basis, their growth became higher than the earlier basket, the, the so-called favorite basket of you know pre-2019. Yeah. And therefore, the valuation started moving up. The, you know, the, the bridge between the huge gap between the valuation between two sectors started narrowing. And as long as uh, you know, growth is there, be it X or Y basket. Uh, you know, we are sector agnostic. Uh, we are market cap agnostic. Uh, what we basically love, love is the capital allocation, decent return on capital employed. Of course, better regulatory policies, the better consistency, and those are the few things which are more important from the investor's perspective. And we need to keep monitoring that. And if we believe that this growth will continue, remain invested. If you think, no, there are some factors which has come and that may lead to change in your growth assumptions, be it public or be it private, uh, be it a, you know, old or be it a new or whatever you want to, you know, categorize it. You need to exit out of it, correct? And because you need to protect capital and create wealth. And that's what, what we 
keep doing it on an everyday basis. I thank you, everyone. I think this session concludes, you know, with the optimistic point of view that, you know, we are not going to see only a milestone of 6 trillion, maybe many more such milestones we'll see and we should have a long-term horizon. And yes, there will be a transformation and to kind of, I would say, experience best wealth creation in, within that transformation, one should give money to some of the experts that we have on our panel. They have their respective strategies and then that is the uh, idea which I thought, you know, I will try to discuss with everyone given their respective forte. Thank you everyone once again.